research, and we've already seen some great stuff. But John, Dr. John Axon is going to present a lot on this topic. He explores transitions to sustainable energy systems. He draws from disciplines of economics, psychology, sociology, and engineering to investigate the nexus of technology, environmental policy, and customer behavior, consumer behavior. Uh, he's an associate professor at Simon Fraser University. John's study of consumer social valuation of plug-in electric vehicles has earned him recognition as Young Researcher of the Year at the OECD's 2011 International Transportation Forum. As, as we, and as we noted earlier, he's still quite young. So, uh, His research group will be releasing a comprehensive report on May 25th summarizing the Canadian plug-in electric vehicle study, which he'll talk about. Am I projecting well? There we go. Now, um, I just came up with this, but it occurred to me that perhaps the biggest barrier to uh, electric vehicles becoming widespread adoption is our fundamental misunderstanding of consumers. And I have been dedicating my research program over the last 10 years to try to understand early buyers and mainstream buyers and to not impose my own thoughts uh, and, and perceptions onto, onto the other people. And uh, I think the greatest strength in this area for, for myself and my research team is that we are more interested in people than we are in technology. And so we're trying to understand what people like, what they're interested in, and how a transition can occur. Now, uh, now I'm taking this, uh, this 10 years of research, maybe 20, 30 projects, and trying to put it into one set of, of insights, at least that I see it, in terms of policy. So let's start off with a quick definition of what I'm talking about with plug-in electric vehicles. I'm including plug-in hybrid vehicles like the Toyota Prius plug-in, the Chevrolet Bolt that can be powered by gasoline and electricity, as well as the pure electric vehicles like the Leaf, the Tesla, and so on. Now, I will dispute with Zachary that Toyota Prius is being lame by having a plug-in hybrid version. And this is actually uh, six or seven years ago. I was in LA presenting to Toyota saying, you should design a vehicle like this because our consumer research in the US at the time, but we can find this also in Canada, continually show, shows us that the mainstream buyers are much more interested in a plug-in hybrid vehicle design, potentially with a very small battery, much more so than a pure electric vehicle. What I'm showing you here is the potential next buyers, the next 33% of new vehicle buying households. And most of those people, well, they, they've all shown us that they would like to pay extra for some type of plug-in electric vehicle, and mostly they want plug-in hybrid vehicles. A good chunk of those are these small plug-in um, so we've found that in the U.S., and this study here I'm showing you is from a, a, it's almost 2,000 new vehicle buying households across Canada. It's part of a very in-depth study with us. Now, well, let's look back at that for a second. Uh, the, the idea, what I'm showing you here, the potential, saying 33% of new vehicle buying households, that's great. Shouldn't that equal 33% market share? We're, we're already there. Now, unfortunately, that is, uh, well, not unfortunately, this is an opportunity for us to look at it um, constructively. This is potential demand. Right, so we have that at the top bar there is 33% of latent demand. If all conditions were perfect, what, if existing preferences could be realized in the market, we'd see that. But then if we put in these real world constraints, such as a lack of awareness, and we see that uh, most people aren't aware. Fact, our research suggests that it's even less than what some other studies say, that it's maybe only 20% of new vehicle buying households that even know what a plug-in hybrid is. So if we take that in there, we get our market share projection even lower. Then if we only can, uh, consider people who have home charging access, and that lowers us a little further still. And then if we consider that, yeah, there's only a few makes and models currently on the market, and some of these dealerships aren't even carrying these vehicles. All of that together <coughs> takes us down from that 33% to about the 1% market share that we see in a jurisdiction like British Columbia right now. See this? So we've listed out some of these barriers, taken the potential, and brought it right back to what it is today. Now, without substantial changes in policy, or some other um, Act so God, I guess, or something, something differently. Um, we're not going to get beyond that, but we're, we're fine. But we can address these barriers. We can be constructive, and we can try and prioritize what we should do. So looking at some of these barriers, the way I look at this is considering uh, there are demand-focused policies. So these are policies that are trying, that are focused on the consumer, trying to create conditions so that buyers uh, are, are more interested or becoming more aware or feel like they can buy an electric vehicle or plug-in electric vehicle. And there are supply-focused policies. These are focused on manufacturers. These are requiring auto companies to sell uh, markets uh, and, and develop vehicles to be sold in any given jurisdiction. We need both of these in order to make a transition that's going to be substantial enough to reduce greenhouse you know, gas emissions uh, within a place like British Columbia. So you can look a little more, de more detail at the different types of policies here. There's a whole bunch, but 
you know, among, among the demand, demand side policies, of course, incentives can be quite powerful. We find that having an incentive, like a five hundred, uh, sorry, five thousand dollar rebate in, in double market share, which can be from one percent to two percent, for example, that's the only thing that changes. Um, home recharging access, public charging, all of that's part of the puzzle. But I really want to draw your attention to a zero emissions vehicle mandate, such as what's in California right now. This is that supply focused policy that requires auto companies to develop, to market, to sell vehicles in that jurisdiction. We don't have something like this in British Columbia right now, and so the vehicles aren't here. Now let's look at this in an integrated perspective, and we've done some modeling work taking all our insights from these you know, almost 2,000 new vehicle buying households, from our, our data set of British Columbia uh, electric vehicle buyers, which I mentioned we have that data, we'll have to share with you. Um, and everything else that we've learned to, to model this out and say, well, if we put in different types of demand policies, so uh, subsidies, uh, increased charging infrastructure, that could get us to something like a 10% market share by 2030. But we're not going to get much higher than that without something like supply focused policy. Now, if we have a zero emissions vehicle mandate that's requiring auto companies to sell a broad variety of vehicles in a jurisdiction like British Columbia and to market them and to have their dealerships selling them actively, then we can get a very ambitious uh, uh, um, adoption rate like you see here, which happens to line up with what we're seeing, what California is targeting with their zero emissions vehicle mandate. To argue even more forcefully for that, this is modeling up to 2050 for the passenger vehicle sector. In order to get to our 2050 targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80%, um, current policies aren't, aren't going to do it. Having even an ambitious set of policies that includes carbon tax isn't quite enough. We need something like a ZEV mandate, some equally powerful supply focused policy to get these vehicles here, to get the automakers doing their part. Um, Putting that another way, what we need in an adoption curve like this, with a Z mandate, we're really getting to the majority of new market share being uh, zero emission vehicles like plug-in electric as early as, as 2030, 2040. So all of this, I think, should inform how we prioritize policy efforts. Now, I know that cities have different abilities than provinces or states, which are different than nations. But overall, we just need to look at what are the important policies to get us to a transition. Number one, supply-focused policy. Every way I look at it is the best way to really trigger a transition. We also need strong demand for this policy. So we, we do need things like financial incentives, like many uh, jurisdictions have a fourth second in place. We do need other incentives, such as HOV lane access and, and uh, parking brakes and so on. Um, in terms of charging, we see that home charging is very important. That's the basis that we work for, especially for plug-in hybrid vehicle buyers that aren't constrained by range limitations. And then public charging is also important there, but unfortunately it tends to be, seems to be the first priority. That's right.